Okay, welcome back. It's episode five of the Health, Wealth and Sex podcast, where we talk about physique development and elite mindsets, elite living, living to thrive, living your greatest life in a body you love. And tonight we're talking about performance enhancing supplements or performance enhancing drugs um, with a female use in mind. Um, so this is like often deeply underground, um, buried in sort of like um, Chinese whispers, you know, bodybuilders do this, do that, you know, making recommendations with the females and actually causing problems, um, which we can talk about down the line uh, when it comes to side effects and so on of certain things. But um, I think what's important to understand here is probably, first of all, whether um, you should be considering any form of hormonal performance enhancement, um, whether you're looking at any of opportunities as an athlete is to go on MediChecks and get an ultimate performance blood test or something similar, but that, that for me gives me the most information. And then you can identify the opportunities in your blood work, which would be limiting factors. Um, see if anything actually needs correcting before you start fucking with it as it were so i think we both <laughs> jamming your fingers in there <laughs> yeah i think alex and i both agree that nothing happens with regard to performance enhancing um drug use or supplement use um without a good understanding of the blood work um in the first place because quite often we can just explore opportunities within that for significant physique benefits and while staying in what a normal range is um and that's going to obviously elicit no sort of long-term consequences you're simply putting yourself in the best possible position to make the most of your physique development and drive and happiness and motivation and so on it's it's almost in this life enhancement type model it's just looking at your hormonal panel and seeing where it can be corrected or optimized I think it's always interesting to me as well how many people um, still aren't reluctant is maybe the wrong word to get blood work. Nowadays, you've got all this data you can glean, which maybe you couldn't get so easily 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. It's going to give you a, a map of, of where you're OK, where you can optimise, where you can improve in order to, you know, uh, drive your maybe physique outcomes, your, you know, just general uh -huh. life improvement diet as well you know and mine, yeah, came back, yeah. mine came back golden but i don't eat enough green vegetables and i was massively deficient in folate and i'm not going to eat more green vegetables because my food volume is just too high yes yeah i don't enjoy them that much no, no my daily asparagus i to simply supplement with folate and now i'm very confident that my next blood panel would be um no missed opportunity so it's not just about is there yeah. an opportunity in thyroid is there an opportunity in the sex hormones and we will get into also PDs that females can use that really just don't affect the hormonal profile, yeah. stress, anything like that. Um, but um, just to go know, on a tangent for a second is vitamins, sorry, and, vitamins and minerals. Just what I'm getting at there is that, you know, is your diet optimal for you to, yeah. you know, thrive, have an optimal hormonal profile and so on. So it's very informative and probably necessary. I think, what, I think what's interesting is as well that sometimes, um, you'll get a new client and uh, they'll give me the, the laundry list of, you know, vitamins and minerals that every, every supplement that's ever been made ever they'll be taking. And I'll be like, okay, cool. You know, on what basis are you taking all of this? You yeah. know, have you had blood work to say, no, no, I just, and it, it, it's just that idea of throwing things at It's like, you can get all this data and actually refine your, your process while yeah. you're taking certain things. I mean, my health supplements list is tiny for a bodybuilder um, and it's on a needs basis. Um, yeah. And the majority of them are prophylactic, if yes. I'm honest, like astralagus. Um, there's very little yeah, that astralagus, has to come yeah. from, from diet or just simply the, the fact that you, you know, rifle through, you know, like magnesium as an athlete and so on. Um, but, um, you know, it used to be a, a whole cupboard full of everything. Yeah. But, and actually, you know, when I started getting digestive issues, which were multifactorial as it came about, um, I just started allowing them to kind of drop off 
I wasn't sure what was maybe one of those was affecting my um my day and certainly allowing that to happen did improve my my digestion mm -hmm. I think not throwing 30 different supplements down with breakfast would have something to do with that um yeah I used to know. have the worst reflux around breakfast and if you looked around that time I used to open my uh my cupboard and you like <laughs> as far as the eye could see big bullet you know and I, there was no rhyme or reason why I was taking any of them you know what I mean you look back and you say did you ever take them liver tablets I don't think I've taken most of the things in the, the yeah li liver yeah, but they were like they were the biggest one they were like a good you had to take five and they were like an inch long yeah, yeah. the job but, in itself isn't it and you, you look back you think can't have been great for me, you know. I don't think my, my my body, especially early in the morning when the body's just sort of coming to, so to speak, to they're swallowing yeah. these bullets, you know. It's yeah. uh, you, you look back and, and but like you say, now you look at your blood work and maybe you need a bit of vitamin D, maybe you know stragglers, things like that, maybe a bit of magnesium. But it's on a needs basis. You know why you're taking it. You're you're yeah. putting your money into other areas. Yeah, and that's going to be. My supplement list as an enhanced athlete will be significantly more um, than a lifestyle client who's not enhanced or minimally enhanced, um, as, as I say. So, um, yeah. Um, so, essentially, we're looking at an uh, entire blood panel uh, first. Um, I'm looking at exploring all opportunities, including dietary. All right, boom. Now we're into, um, okay, what if we have an opportunity and we're likely to see these. We can probably expect to see these in females who diet chronically, um, bikini competitors, for example, competed multiple times, peri perimenopausal females, and also females on ostensibly very low maintenance calories, which you can confirm um, that may have thyroid issues. So, mm -hmm. There's, there's some, you know, sort of demographics where it's likely that you're going to be looking at those opportunities. And you'd probably discuss that at kind of consultation. If a client came your way, you know, they'd probably be seeing um, evidence of hormonal issues. Um, so you'd be kind of looking out for that. Um, and simply, and all of this will end up forming kind of a baseline model that a female could use um all components of all the relevant components of year round all right yes. without risk of virilization or anything like that from so this isn't about exposure to anabolic steroids it's everything else and later on we can talk about when and if it's appropriate to expose yourself to anabolics and and what females should be looking at there um so biggest opportunity typically across the spectrum is is usually in thyroid yeah i was gonna say where uh, would you start then so thyroid yeah, so, is where you start. Yeah. Thyroid, first of all, I mean, it can track over time, um, as it did with your own. Um, if yes. there's an indication of something like high thyroid antibodies, but normal thyroid function, but over time we're seeing that that's diminishing. Yeah, diminishing down here. Um, if they have poor thyroid function, high thyroid antibodies, something like Hashimoto's, basically um, the you're going to be looking for probably combined therapy ideally just because general feedback T4, T3. But how yeah. you feel is that t4 and t3 combined therapy um is a little bit more um quality of life beneficial than just monotherapy which is t4 only as, yeah. as it cascades to t3 so essentially looking at replacement dose there now if yeah. you're doing this yourself and you're doing it blind a ballpark of what's going to put you in the right range and you monitor at the next um, blood panel would be 100 micrograms of T4 and probably 25 micrograms of T3. Um, and you split the T3 AM, PM into 12.5? T4 with its its longer active life, it's not necessary. T3, I personally don't split dose it. Um, okay. you, you can, um, but it does have like a, a more a shorter active life, um, but by no means... Is it necessary to split dose no. it? Similarly, it's not necessary to microdose, um, but generally it elicits greater stability. I so don't... with thyroid, then when would you when would you retest back? You say you're going blind with it. When would you retest back to 
to check where things are? How long would you tend to leave that? Yeah, I mean, let's say that there's other factors involved. Um, maybe after three months. Yeah. Um, because you we need you need to see like trending and, and things to settle in. Um, also, yeah, being aware that um, time of day and things like that can can like if you're taking T three in the yeah. morning and not in the evening but you have your blood taken in the afternoon, you know, it might show your T3 just slightly on the lower side than you might like, but actually it's, it's probably fine. It's just tapered down. Yes. Um, yeah. So, okay. So that's probably the biggest, easiest opportunity to take is if there's an opportunity. Now, if your thyroid function is normal, don't fuck with it. You don't mess around with it. Yeah. Unless you're heading into an extreme diet, females will downregulate um, pretty rapidly. Yeah. Imagine if we think about like survival. Um, in I'm gonna say, what's the difference between men and men and women then, from your point yeah, of view? Yeah, so so in in case of a famine, a man would still be, you know, uh, required to hunt and provide. Yeah. So would remain functional. At, at, so well, you wouldn't see down regulation as body fat decreases um, as early on. And with a female, yeah. that would start to happen within like three days of and being quickly. Death yeah. Death. So females are very adaptive in that, and they're also very adaptive in terms of their neat expenditure. And you can track steps all you like, but your body <laughs> can't regulate in many ways uh, in terms of overall expenditure. Yeah, uh, moving around. Yeah. So, so females are already up against it in terms of like adaptation. They can't usually diet as in such a linear fashion. They linear get fashion. diet breaks and so on. It just requires more time and more finesse than dieting a male who can simply be put in a calorie deficit given a fixed amount of activity and probably get in as good a shape as he'll need to. Yes. You'll suck right. it up to some degree. The body will keep responding. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So um, if you're going to diet as well, it's pretty sensible to uh, use a thyroid replacement, yes. um, particularly if it's a prolonged diet. Again, lifestyle clients dropping a pound a week, six weeks, having a diet break, having a deload, going back in, you know, it, it's really, this is going to be problematic when you start to get very lean. All right. Yeah. Um, and stay lean for a long period of time. Um, then we've got other um, avenues or sort of vectors for um, hypertrophy and also just general health. So whether it's neuroprotective, antioxidant, um, fluid balance management, we can include an angiotensin receptor blocker, like telmisartan that's very commonly used in the physique realm now um probably in a female that might be around the 20 milligram dose i was gonna say yeah um, 20, 20 milligrams met, as opposed to the 40 yeah. yeah metformin again very dependent on food intake and, de and, and demand but typically between 250 and 500 milligrams a day again they could be on a, a higher fat lower carb diet because that's their preference um in which case you'd probably be looking at more like 250 milligrams. Um, so generally titrating uh, metformin up to the carbohydrate. With the carbohydrate intake, yeah. You're still going to have like a lot of the benefits, but in this case, we're not really using it so much for like nutrient partitioning. Um, it's more of the antioxidant effect. Um, there's injectable L-carnitine. Um, and now we're getting into like root of administration, which can be a barrier injecting yourself um and generally we use the the fine insulin needles uh with females yeah. so very um accessible but um injectable l-carnitine works a treat in terms of um being a lipid transporter um and kind of an ergogenic aid as in your training performance will, will be higher and so that's more of an endurance aspect um but for analogy it's it's used for doping in horses um, to make them run exactly. faster for longer so that's the performance benefit you can expect um just on a tangent you, you mentioned metformin before what what's your thoughts on berberine just to berberine is an meat. excellent glucose disposal agent it's also yep. traditionally used in chinese medicine um to treat diarrhea um despite being a laxative which is interesting they also <laughs> use it in diabetics so they got that bit right um berberine's great um in many ways, but it's not metformin and it doesn't no. act on the same pathways. So I would perhaps use berberine in conjunction 
with metformin yeah. in a high carb diet, but probably it's not necessary. And so for me, metformin supersedes berberine. And now what's the point taking berberine? Yeah, I, I, it's, exactly. Same, same thought process. I just know that that sometimes I listen to, you know, obviously various podcasts and bits and pieces and there can be some sort of discrepancy between them, but I'm, I'm on the same page with you. I, I always lean into metformin. You're not taking metformin, go ahead and take berberine. Yeah. Um, but you're looking at nutrient partition as the benefit there. Um, there's it's not in the same way as antioxidant, neuroprotective, or anything like that. No. Okay. Um, so we've got the injectable L carnitine in there, and that would be dosed around two milligrams per kilogram. All yeah. right. You weigh 100 kilograms, you get 200 milligrams um, daily um growth hormone is incredibly lip lipolytic in females great for body composition yes air, yeah. skin everything that vitamin e is doing for you um sleep quality and everything um and what's cool with that with females is you can get that as a topical patch that equates to about 1.5 units we might be making maybe 0.6 naturally um, so you can have quite a, a large benefit from essentially putting on the equivalent of a nicotine patch and wearing that overnight while you're you in haven't got that injectable mode. barrier. Yeah. yeah, while you're in recovery mode, while you're mobilizing fat, it's not something you need to keep in the fridge. Uh, it's more suitable for lifestyle clients. Okay, you know, are these <laughs> what's mummy's needles? Uh, you know, <laughs> um, we can't be doing that. So those, those patches are, are an excellent, excellent addition. Um, and that's about this kind of the size of it in terms of a general baseline model um, yes. without getting into um, sex hormone function. We do have fat, sort of your fat burning aids. I was going to say. Available yeah. to females, um, yeah. which in particular with clenbuterol in terms of its muscle sparing capabilities, um, you know, even at 20 micrograms, um, that's very effective in females um, and your him being HCL as well yeah. used uh, fasted as a fat mobilizing tool. So um, not that it, it burns fat particularly, um, no. but it aids the process of burning fat. If you're going to then go and do non-glucose intensive activity, um, which is really what we should be doing fasted. Um, as soon as we start doing glucose intensive activity fasted, um yeah one there might be a bit of an aspect of muscle tissue breakdown but that's not my main concern it's more that you're depleting glycogen stores which are meant for training performance the central nervous system activity it's tiring uh, so it, it takes away from the training performance um nor is it particularly fat oxidating because it's glucose intensive so sure. we should really be doing our morning tasks, cleaning the house, walking the dog, and so yeah. on in a fasted state to make the most out of the growth hormone and the yohimbine and caffeine, black coffee, yeah, no calories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a lovely stack, yeah. Right, because you've got fat mobilizing aids in the um, caffeine. Um, you've got and, and the uh, growth hormone, um absolutely and the yohimbine and then maybe you've got a lipid transporter in the injectable l-carnitine but either way um doing a lot of sort of pottering about walking sort of level uh activity while fasted and using those drugs is is going to be significantly more effective than like that's why people say fasted cardio it makes no difference fasted or fed it does if you use those performance exactly drugs. yes and it's significant yes. and that's yes. one of the main reasons why bodybuilders often favor fasted cardio precisely that's and the, 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 the bit missing, they miss out is the missing in conjunction bit, with the drugs yeah, the growth hormone yes yeah yeah, they, 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 yeah exactly they, they tend to to omit that bit a uh, genuine question what um is there any benefit of clenbuterol over salbutamol? Salbutamol being with its shorter half-life, do you have a preference yeah. for females one over the other? You wouldn't use sal salbutamol. Okay. Um, so you, you're putting that in with what two-hour active life or something like that, yeah. primarily as a, a stimulant, uh, sort of a met metabolic driver, whilst doing some activity. Um, and 
that's something you and I both leverage because we don't like the 30 hour active life of clenbuterol. Um, we're sensitive to it, impacts sleep and so on. Um, so we, for us, it's quite a systemic stressor, but for most people within about three, four days, they start to tolerate it well. Um, and again, in a female, that dose is being starting at 20 micrograms is very tolerable. Um, yeah. Whereas for me to see it significant impact from clenbuterol, it probably start at 40 micrograms and a lot of bodybuilders will use anything up to 200, to be honest. Right. Because yeah. they'll titrate it up over the prep until they yes because they get used to it take more get used to it, take more um, until yeah. running off that stimulant effect as well which not ideal so we've got those um, they're pretty all safe and sound you can use those on a regular basis it can form part of your daily routine in the majority yes. of cases I wouldn't necessarily use a yohimbine and clenbuterol daily year round but. To be honest, in those doses, you could. I was going to say low enough doses, maybe. Yeah, they're just they're just a systemic stressor. But as long as your yes. allostatic load, um, yeah. your sum of all stresses is well managed, I wouldn't see it as problematic. So then we get into the interesting stuff, which is yep. the sex hormones, and what people would have the most questions about. Um, and here so we got a couple of different routes into this is one in that initial blood work that the testosterone is low and that can be just naturally low it can be suppressed by method of birth control which is something to always explore um generally speaking the hormonal coil has the least impact on the sex hormones and the sort of best outcomes in terms of managing the the menstrual cycle um whereas the non-hormonal coil which of course you think it's it's not hormonal at all that this seems yeah. to increasingly cause really nasty periods so whereas with the hormonal coil they they decline with time so um yeah that's pretty good or or no birth control um yeah. that's going to so those are factors. Um, but if there's an opportunity in testosterone, you'd be looking at testosterone replacement. Um, your body will convert that in its own way. We're all individuals um, into estrogen. It will use some of that testosterone to create progesterone. Those should all be in the right ratios because that's your normal body's process. Um, it can be a little bit different in um, sort of postmenopause or perimenopausal females. They might need a combined therapy um, of testosterone, estrogen, maybe you know, progesterone, or maybe testosterone and progesterone. Um, depends what's what's not coming out, um, you know, in the blood work after the initial sort of TRT. Yeah. And the dosing there is probably between. I was going to say dosing, yeah. It's probably between two and six milligrams. So I was going to go in initially with three milligrams a week. And then again, at three months in, just check that that might have put someone right at the top of the normal range. In um, which case, yeah. Or they they may still be way under. Um, and you'd just be looking at like high normal as optimal, really. Because um, you don't want it out of super physiological, of course, do you? Yeah. You want it sitting in that physiological range. Yeah. Um, so that's just the correction. All right. And that's with all those other um performance enhancing aids we've got no steroids there and you, you'll get in great shape you don't need them let's say that you're a competitor now and you are going to look at use of anabolic steroids and you absolutely will need to unless you've got insane genetics for more muscular divisions it's maybe or maybe not necessary for bikini very dependent on genetics but for pretty much all the other all divisions, it, will be, it will be needed um, and the first thing is to say that in terms of muscle building, all anabolics, which are derivatives of testosterone, are going to have the same sort of muscle building capabilities, but they're all they're going to have very different side effects. Side so, effects. And that's yeah. something acutely um, important in females because let's say they take wind stroll because... Somebody, some guy in the gym told them it helps them burn fat. 
that kind of because it's a cutting 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 big spot. dave yeah yeah um anyway <laughs> uh, <laughs> always a big day anyway that'll break the voice real quick like yeah really quick um so essentially the ones that are well tolerated in females they have the least amount of virilization um, which means masculinization in the doses that females are going to use we're not really worried about any other health markers all mm. right but we're really worried about masculinization so anavar super accessible in terms of root ad administration because it's yes. uh, oral um but you want to make sure that you actually are taking anavar it's very benign as well um prim if you're going to use injectables prima bolin prima, um, yeah. uh, and masteron and out of those three the main the most important thing for me is like an individual's response their tolerance so massive fluid retention on primobolan okay uh let's try master your drugs master yeah. i get on well with um you know don't want to do injections you know irregular with their injections yeah. whatever um anavar um, anavar ab yeah absolutely fine um also easier to sort of travel with and depends on the lifestyle um so those are the three and generally i don't prefer one or the other um 35 to 70 in, milligrams per week maybe in, in the in the more advanced females um you'd be looking at injectables obviously because we don't yes. be taking we, they might be taking up to 300 milligrams a week of something like right. and the very biggest classes and um you wouldn't want to do that with anavar time or any, you know any or okay no. so well, you probably could get away with it to be fair <laughs> um yes yeah, so um there's this baseline of the testosterone that needs to be protected so with a male user they'd never normally take a, a dht derivative on its own sort of sans estrogen um, because they'd want to make sure that they had a baseline level of estrogen whereas they'd feel like crap um, yes. and they'd have sexual dysfunction and or, or mental health issues probably in all sorts so we want to kind of protect that baseline of testosterone estrogen progesterone so you're just keeping in that so that's another reason to have trt is if you're going to have these cyclical exposures to anabolics it's just having a nice stable baseline the base, yes. because if you think about it anavar is missing any conversion to estrogen, estrogen right so you've got an incomplete hormonal profile already so in that sense it's deleterious um so you'd always want that baseline if you're going to use and then you'd have an exposure time of maybe four to six weeks um 2.5 to 10 milligrams a day yep. you know a start off you know on the lower end see what the response is is more even necessary and just remember with exposures um they're probably best deployed when you can get the most out of them so yes. can i eat in a calorie surplus consistently can i train and recover consistently is this like a good block to do this in am i in a good position physiologically um because think of virilization as like a, a cup that can never be emptied out and that cup will fill up really rapidly with testosterone for example yes. um which is why you're using a replacement dose and not more um but if you took 70 milligrams of testosterone a week well you're just a little bit shy of what's required for a sex change so and yeah you'll see and so that cup will fill up rapidly so imagine you can never empty that cup out so for a bikini career of the last let's say six years seven years with you know three two to three exposures to anabar per year it wouldn't it wouldn't fill that cup and you know we wouldn't remotely come close to um yes station but if you were going to take 100 milligrams of nandrolone a week um absolutely yeah that's the yeah that, that bikini career is ending quickly yeah you again you're into like hormonally speaking you've done that for long enough um yeah. you know that's that's your, your sex change um uh, you know at least on a hormonal level that's how they would run it um yes it's sort of a chemical equivalent 
um because nandrol is often sort of touted as like fine for females and well tolerated that's um nandrolone is as close to testosterone as a sort of a synthetic um steroid would be just in the sense that it converts to xenoestrogens and so, yes. so it, it, it's testosterone like and estrogen like and it has the same sort yeah. of same broadly speaking the same outcomes um whilst being significantly more neurotoxic and therefore rendered like pointless in the bodybuilding yeah. or realm because you would just use testosterone instead more testosterone it, yeah I, I, absolutely it's um it boggles my mind sometimes yeah. what people lean into yeah so that's sort of the sum of a kind of a, a female pd use model that's pretty much everything that's available to them that wouldn't be you know on amazon supplements yeah um, and broadly speaking how to run it is to kind of set a standard baseline of of optimal um and then if you know it's particular to the individual um they might have some exposures to uh you know anabolics and yeah master on um over time so it's got that nice kind of baseline vibe and again with lifestyle clients just looking at small opportunities within that is trt appropriate um is thyroid replacement appropriate will they benefit then or from additionally taking metformin and telmasartan um you know we don't need to talk then about you know, him being in clenbuterol and you know the real no. sort of like physique to the development type drugs but those would be the ones to look at in terms of like uh, living your greatest life at any age. Yes. Yeah. No, I think, I think what I've always liked is building models that can be run for, for long time frames that will give you, um, what's what I'm looking for? Slam the table in your favor, make, a, you know, make basically your outcomes better without accruing any negatives or minimal, minimal negatives. And, um, sort of this polypharmacy model where things are run at l low doses, low enough doses, though they're not deleterious to health, but at the same time will have a, a noticeable effect is, is absolutely the way yeah. forward. Also for, for, for males as well. So instead of popping a steroid, you're um, taking this combination of um, drugs that are non-steroidal, and won't add to that cup, won't be realized, won't yes. um, absolutely complement your health um, and well-being as well. So just for bikini, typically, um, yeah, I was gonna say, just, what, just optimizing yeah. the hormonal profile would, uh, and adding growth hormone would be sufficient. Um, you know, as a performance enhancing tool for body composition, I think for females, growth hormone is absolutely fantastic. Those that one unit in the morning, one unit in the evening, that'd be perfect. If the yes. thyroid function's normal, the sex I'm hormone like function's normal, that would be plenty, plenty of a game changer. Yeah, yeah. And like like, like you say, we're, we're leaning into things that don't, you know, increase the chance of viralization, that have good outcomes and... Again, I'm a, a big fan of girls who want to, you know, be be optimized. Growth hormone, low dose clen, yohim bine. They know they get big benefits, you know, that'd from be, that that'd alone. Be, that'd, be, that'd be fine, absolutely yeah. fine, absolutely fine. And um, Joe, my coach, actually um, just put me on to um, with the yohim bine clenbutol with that kind of stimulant feeling which for me drives anxiety, um, like feelings, panic almost, like perception yeah. of stress, feeling like I'm being bombarded. So I'm getting my normal amount of client messages, but it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's just, come on, just answer your messages. Um, <laughs> it's just a feeling. Um, but he's had me take L-theanine at yeah. 400 milligrams and NAC at... 1500 to 2000 so in the tablets i've got it's ended up being 1800 milligrams and it's a very it, it really is a smoother like i haven't had uh obviously with pre-workout but i haven't had like a, a crazy stimulant sort of feeling which being in prep um actually i was kind of like 
ransacking my morning expenditure, you know, kind of sort of riding yeah. this stimulant wave and then training and then, you know, obviously sort of working in the evening seated. Um, so it has been interesting because without that kind of uh, external nervous energy input, um, it, I've kind of been more mindfully doing my cardio. Yes. It, it's just yeah, felt yeah. a little bit different, but I don't miss that because every high comes with a low. Um, and I haven't, well, been, that's it. I haven't been getting an afternoon crash now. Um, so that's been really good. Um, so again, if you are using, say, growth hormone, yohimbine and clenbuterol, um, but they do have um, a bit of an effect on just feeling overstimulated or, or generating feelings of anxiety, those two supplements off Amazon work really well for me. I used to take um, L-theanine and I did, I did like it. What I actually found better and I've never ever moved away from is, um, well, it's a matcha green tea, which includes nat naturally, and I'm not saying natural is always better because it's not, but it naturally includes L-theanine, the caffeine with the L-theanine. Right, right. So you get the nice, the nice sp spike from the caffeine, but it's, it's mirrored with the calming effect. Right, of so you're, yeah, okay, so... Your... Well, I dropped a coffee and had that, and it, that that's that's lovely. So you feel alert but soothed almost at the okay. same time. So let's say that um, you feel overstimulated just from coffee. Um, you're definitely going to be sensitive to these. Um, it sounds like matcha green tea could be a bit of a game changer. Unfortunately, I'm great. not a tea drinker, <laughs> and I don't like green tea. So I, I'm like that. If I don't like it, I'm not going to eat it or drink like... it. I'll just my, take my the, antidote is. A, I'll take is, the supplement. Is, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say my antidote to matcha tea, and I'm sure that the uh, the, the you know the match, matcha matcha uh, zealots will have me for this. Is I put some bit of whole milk and honey in it, and maybe I just like drinking warm warm milk and honey, and it's not got that nothing to do quite with nice the matcha, actually, but it's pretty good, mate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm being in prep, almost everything is appealing at the moment, which is a good sign that my appetite's high. Because as we've, as we've talked about before, the baked goods you're, are going to get. If you're it. sat there thinking, "Fuck, I'm hungry," but you've got a fridge full of good quality food, you don't want any of that. You no. want pizza. You're not hungry at all. You know your belly might even be full. That's just hunger signaling, and it's yeah. triggering old reward reward pathways, reward which pathways. we talked about before. And it's really interesting to. I don't know if I mentioned, um, but a really fantastic book is by Stephen Nguyen called The Hungry Brain. And it explores, it, yeah. it, it almost takes the power out of um, our tendencies to overeat junk food, to overeat generally, um, fixations on junk food and foods that don't serve us. Because it, you know, for me, what my main take home was how profound these reward pathways were, that they never went away that the more that you fed them, the the kind of the louder they were, um, you know, shouting pizza, ice cream, pizza, ice cream at me, um, you know, and if you don't use those pathways for a while, they're still there, um, but they're not as as active and that voice isn't as loud. Um, but hunger, high hunger signaling absolutely wakes them up. And if you think about that in the context of, you know, sayings like, never go grocery shopping when you're hungry, right? Because you buy a load of crap. That's those reward pathways shit, activating. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, so, so when you're hungry, you should eat a good quality meal um, yeah. and, and you won't crave the junk anymore. It's as simple as that. Um, and the more that you do that, the less likely you are to go down the route of having the junk as well. Um, but that's just an aside. And yeah, it's just something that, in this prep in particular, I've been able to kind of sit and observe and go, oh, and that's that pathway um, yeah. going. I think, you know. I, yeah, I think one of the things about getting older is, is you know, you'd like to think for some of us it comes, you know, that ability to observe and to reflect. So there might be the time when, you know, you've, you've got your diet that's full of good food that you really enjoy. And for whatever reason, you have a, a Domino's or a pizza or whatever. Which you can have. Like, Which you can I, have. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. After once you've eaten it, you know, all in the moment, it's pretty damn good. You're like, did I enjoy that as much as my brain said? Because my brain had this whole romance going on with it. Now, the answer might be yes. But sometimes I'm like, it wasn't even yeah. that good. It's a bit like going out drinking, you know, is it worth crap night's sleep, the digestive distress, yeah, yeah. feeling bad the next day? 
because I so really is that food a reward? On balance, you know, yeah. Um, but like again, if you moderated it and actually ate like two slices, you'd be fine. Yeah. Um, but like you know, my go to just be to have like a frozen sourdough pizza or something in the freezer. Yeah. So if I yeah, wanted yeah. that, I'd you know I'd pick something that didn't disrupt my sleep or digestion. Um, so again, just leaning into higher quality foods there. Um, when you're not in a diet setting sets you up for better behaviors when you do diet because if you yes. if you eat junk as a reward generally when you start dieting that's going to be absolutely a fixation and it'll be yeah. problematic if you make it through the diet without it um immediately post diet that's when binging and rapid weight. when you yeah when you know you can quote unquote go again have you have you have you have you, have you gone I, back to after old, I think my second show I've got this memory of going into <laughs> the grocery store and I didn't know what I wanted. But so I got like lots of different options. So did I want lasagna? Did I want crispy pancakes? Yeah. Did I want fish finger sandwich? Did I, or potato, all these different things, different oh, ice man. creams and stuff. Now, the idea being that you'd get home and you'd choose one of those as a meal and eat it. And I, An ate, like, yeah. I ate all of them. Yeah, yeah all of them yeah. uh, so, so you know you learning and if there's like this is where it's like nice to share these kind of observations and everything is because like if people are going down that path you know there's like quite easy routes out um and just an awareness that you know it, it's problematic um and it doesn't need to be that way there's always like a solution um and and generally you eat eat your way out of it with whole foods men get away with it far more yes. um you know it it goes on harder because you know the, it's hard for them to out eat such a you know such a low calorie maintenance um but you know and, and they're more comfortable being being fluffier really um so. well guys, guys are getting big arms in the t-shirt and they could ignore the the big waist in the trousers. You know? <laughs> if your chest is big enough, you know it, uh, the Fine. t-shirt doesn't catch on the belly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's always my off-season goal. <laughs> I think what's um again, we, like you said about the idea of community and, and saying all these things. I have clients who, who at times, you know, sort of really beat them. Up. They they'll say things to me like, um, oh, "I want to be as disciplined as you," and it's like, I don't know what happened over time. I I learned to get better. But I've absolutely yeah. been, you know, where, you know, all yeah. of the food in or or it's go time. It's it's a learning process. Yeah, the whole thing. I think with the guys that have done it for a long time, it's not a discipline matter. It, um, it's not discipline it's, anymore. It's simply their pattern. Um, it, it's now their preferred pattern. Um, yeah, initially building that pattern, um, it isn't like a complete lifestyle and dietary overhaul. Um, it's just subtle adjustments and looking for opportunities. Um, you know, I, I had one lady who came to me when I was personal training and uh, she wanted to lose weight. And um, so, you know, I showed her how to work out and got her training with weights and everything and mm. just to keep a food diary for one week. And within that food diary, she ate super well, but twice a week she had a large pizza. So we stopped having the large pizzas and she lost all the weight. Yeah, bang. that was one adjustment, you know, yes. um, and of course, I suggested other things that she could eat and so on and so forth. Um, but she simply did stop doing one thing. Uh, that was the change. She needed. And yeah. I think she she wanted to lose 20 pounds. She lost 20 pounds. We didn't even need to work together for long. You know, no. it was very straightforward. Um, so, yeah, it can be interesting anyway, um, just to explore small opportunities uh, rather than thinking that you need to be doing this sort of um, prescribed cardio prescribed nutrition five meals a day you yeah. know training program everything like that um, you know depending on your goal and how advanced you are and by then you've sort of built built to it with time as well and what never works is giving somebody who's fairly new to um body composition change if you want to call it that um like a 
a, a dietary overhaul, an advanced training program, a cardio routine, exactly. um, you know, fit that into your day, off you go. There might have been no need, to be honest. I think, I th yeah, I, I agree. And I think, but I think sometimes there can be almost, and not pushback, but, um, but this isn't complicated enough. There's not enough spinning wheels on it. It's like, trust me, if you if you do these five or six things, I'm gonna ask, do these five things this week and come back to me next week and let's see what happens. It's like okay. shit, I lost I five pounds. What what's the start point? You know, um, what's your daily steps? Two thousand. Okay. Yeah. Well, this exactly. month you're gonna work, walk for one hour a day. Yeah. Okay. Com complete. That's a, a massive life changing thing. You know, they'll yeah. lose weight, they'll be healthier, feel better. And and you know what, like the secret to having longevity and feeling good isn't um, forcing change and adaptation on your body like we do. Um, it's probably re moderate resistance training, you know, to preserve muscle mass, maybe build it, you know, if you enjoy it, like whatever. Um, but it's coming out of the gym feeling better than when you went. Um, it's eating well from a whole foods diet, um, you know, that supports your, your performance, um, getting a great night's sleep, um, and walking. And yes. this is the number one thing that you can do, you know, to, to change your life is if you're sedentary, it's just start w w walking more, more. Yeah. um, and you'll get fantastic health and physique outcomes just from walking. Yeah. So yeah. particularly after, after meals as well, you know, aid with digestion and it, it, it's just, and again, it's it's these these things that are overlooked because um, and I understand why people are looking for sh the, the next shiny object, the next trick. But again, the snake oil salesmen everywhere, <laughs> they will give you what what you what you want to hear. You know, I can. It, it's your gut microbiome. It's probably I, yeah. not. You know, I can get you shredded in 12 weeks. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Now, and I can do that very simply. You know, yeah. I give you the advice now. You're going to go and work out with weights six days a week. Um, you're going to do an hour of cardio twice a day, yeah. and yeah. your diet's going to be fish and vegetables. Go, um, yeah, five times a day. Okay, there you go. You're shredded. Yeah. And what right. next? If you if you can stick it out long enough, if you can last. It. Um, and then not get incredibly fat immediately afterwards. Yeah, and not not want to exercise ever again. <laughs> so yeah, so and be you know you, you hear it, don't you? That uh, people are, are done with bodybuilding, or the or even they're done with, you know, that's enough out of that. I don't want to be lean anymore. It wasn't worth it. But it's it's bodybuilders it's get done with bodybuilding, and they're like, I'm just sick of eating the same boring food all the time. It's like, bro, why did you eat boring food for two decades? You know, because they they wanted the goal and they believe that was what was necessary. Um, but yeah, it, it's categorically not necessary all right no it, I, I, absolutely not it, and it, i think there's a lot of um you know and there still is a lot of bro law this is the way it has to be done has to be done this way it's like i don't yeah. know if you've you've figured out what's actually driving progress and i've talked about this before yeah. is once you figure out what's actually driving progress you realize there are a multitude of ways to actually approach said yeah. goal it's not just yeah. chicken and rice it's not just yeah, you know. this, this is like a like a boredom factor. You know, bodybuilding. There's two non-negotiables. One is hunger, and one <laughs> is eating when you're not hungry. <laughs> but the majority of the time you will spend bodybuilding and be doing one of those two things. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. it was probably a good note to wrap up on for the evening. Um, good chat. I hope it's useful to the listeners. Um, if you've got questions, you can write those in the comments. Uh, there's direct links to our Instagrams if you want to get in touch um, if you think that you've got a hormonal issue and you want to get the ball rolling um, you know book in for some blood work get that blood work analyzed um, get recommendations that kind of stuff um, simple Q&A's we're always here for you so you know don't hesitate to reach out um, Alex have you got anything to wrap up with I'm hungry. I'm going to go and eat. That's 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 yeah, it. We're both dieting. Yeah, we're <laughs> dinner as well. It's that's all laid out. As good as it gets. All laid out. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. So thank you for listening, guys, and we'll see you again next week when we should have another special guest. So we'll see you there. <laughs>